Again, welcome everyone. We will now begin the program. Good evening. Thank you all for being here. This is um, a very exciting time, not only in our country, but in our association, because this is a time during our association's annual meeting where we get a chance to not only engage with one another, but also to think about our purpose. And the opening session today is a very important part of what we do because it serves a pivotal role of helping to center us, to have us think very critically about what the work is that we do and how we do it. And so I want us today to take this time to sort of literally and metaphorically open the convention together. We want to welcome our attendees. We want to take a sneak peek at what's to come. We want to use this time to inspire our intellectual labor, but also situate our praxis. And simultaneously, we want to elevate our thinking and stretch our imaginations about our legacy and our relevance. Thank you to Amber Johnson and to Javon Johnson, who both helped to organize this session. Thank you as well to our sponsor, uh, Routledge, Taylor, and Francis. They have done this opening session for many years, and uh, they've been so generous with their support. And without them, the session simply would not rise to the level that we would like, and so we just are so grateful for them. They also helped to, um, to sponsor those individuals whose visit with us today comes from other parts of the country and outside of our discipline, and so we thank our guests for being here with us as well. <laughs> you will be introduced to them shortly. This is meant to be an interactive panel of communication scholars and poets who do work around social identity, but it's also meant to connect our scholars in communication with individuals who are also carrying the message forward in very poetic and strategic ways. And so we thank them for their creative vision and for the labor they do outside of the academy. Thank you for your work. I'm actually finding that it's quite exhilarating and actually have this somewhat giddy anticipation of what it's like to in engage in an interactive panel. We've been promised this is going to be an interactive panel where poets are going to engage the audience a little bit differently. And so I'm looking forward to, to doing that. The invited panelists and poets will use poetry and aesthetic responses to ask each other and the audience to think critically about the legacies we carry forward with us and who those legacies belong to, how they potentially impact our futures, and what we must invent to critically imagine new futures and remain relevant. The lineup is absolutely exciting. I can't wait. And with no further ado, we will invite them. But let me just, before we do that, let me just see if we can get individuals who are in the back to come forward. We want to kind of like fill out this, this session in the front. So if we can have the furthest row be maybe like right about where the second row is here. <laughs> so everyone else, please come up in the front. And thank you once again for being here. <laughs> Doctors Johnsons, <laughs> Javon and Amber Johnson, everyone. All right, welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome to our very long title, Engaging the Verbs of Social Justice as We Trace Our Legacies and Our Relevance, the opening session of NCA's 103rd Annual Convention. I am Amber Johnson. Hey. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I am Javon Johnson. Um, This evening's interactive panel features dynamic artists, activists, and academics to borrow Dwight Conquer Good's still pithy uh, alliteration. Engaging the verbs of social justice. When we crafted this title, we were thinking specifically about what it means to become, verb, our legacies, right? Our relevance. And one of the verbs we enacted was literally opening the doors. 
opening the doors to our discipline in ways that push for radical inclusion, or bringing our whole selves into spaces far beyond our research, our degrees, and our accomplishments. Instead of waiting for someone to choose to include our bodies, we chose to enact agency, becoming the verbs of social justice and creating an open session that speaks to what our bodies do in public and private spaces as signs of complicity and protest, as just heroes and villains. For our actions are never without consequence, nor are they without contestation. But what even is our? Our, from the Latin nos, meaning we, we, which is indeed the nominative plural of I, is used to denote an other, which begs the question, who are the others in our legacy and our relevance? Who gets to answer that question? And equally important, who gets to ask it? But rather than working to save the so-called others, a binary empowered or disempowered move that is not very different from the colonial project of exploitation and domination, the artists in tonight's performance demand that we think about the encounter with one another in a kind of Levinasian responsibility that recognizes I owe more to the other than I do myself. Tonight, we are joined by Ed Mabry, Amani Cezanne, God's Islander, Benny Lamaster, Miranda Osman, Dana Cloud, Trish Su uh, Suchi, uh, Julianne Scott, and Jeffrey McCune, all remarkable people who blur the lines between activism, scholarship, performance, artistry, and humanity. When we crafted this, po this panel, we asked all of the poets to submit something that they wanted to share. And our poets are both poets and scholars, not just poets or just scholars. And then we ask people in our discipline to respond. What does it look like to respond? How does it feel to respond? And some of those responses are poetic. Some of those responses are performance-based. Some of them are based in questions. Um, so tonight what you will see is a poet performing and two academics responding, but in ways that aren't so clear, clearly marked, or filled with boundaries. So as we open the conference, we ask you to enter the space at the learning edge where discomfort sparks change, where respect is complex, and where honesty can be deemed a radical act of resistance. So welcome. Welcome. Clap, applause. <laughs> <laughs> so before we uh, bring up the first uh, performer and the performance response, uh, really quickly, just, just make some noise really quickly. Everybody applaud, we're here. <laughs> I want you to remember that this is indeed a performance panel, that if you hear something tonight that makes you wanna laugh, clap, yell, holler, high five somebody, by all means do so. What I am saying is let's learn something and let's have a good damn time, is that okay? <laughs> Without further ado, Without your further first ado. performer, put your hands together for Amani Cezanne. And Benny Lamaster. How y'all doing? That was whack. <laughs> How y'all doing for real? <laughs> that was better. Always go for better. Y'all teachers, right? That's what I was taught by my teacher. Do better. <clears throat> I'm never more reminded of my blackness than when I'm in an airport walking through TSA. The security administration, whose job it is to keep the planes from terrorism, to keep the people safe. The first time my hair was detained by TSA, they told me it was just a precaution, that it was just to make sure that if this black girl hair hadn't done anything wrong, well then it didn't have anything to worry about. The second time my hair was detained by TSA, a blonde with more flakes on her shoulders than a box of cereal asked me why my curls were so moist and conditioned, why they foamed at the mouth. She said my hair looked hungry for the blood it deserves, rebellious the way it defies gravity while coiled into a fist, million man marches toward a well-trimmed riot. The third time my hair was detained by TSA, he poked and prodded my scalp like I was up for purchase, like, like this black girl hair might be for sale. He called my 
afro a magic trick, an illusion, how it shrinks and then blows up. He feared my hair might blow up, might retaliate, might pounce like an Oakland panther armed and black. The fourth time my hair was detained by TSA, I realized it had happened enough times for me to write a poem. The fifth time, the fifth time, the fifth time my hair asked to speak to a supervisor. Now the supervisor told my hair it was overreacting. Shouldn't speak so loudly, so angrily. Should relax, should conform, should have straightened itself out before it got here. And then maybe it wouldn't have ended up in these types of situations. The sixth, seventh, and eighth times my hair was detained by TSA. It had flashbacks to red ketchup poured over black naps at white only counters. And Don Imus' disdain for nappy headed hoes. And how pretty, how pretty, how pretty those four little girls' hair must have been for church that day. My head thought about what it means to commit an act of terror, considered the irony of terrorizers accusing the terrorized of terrorism, how they would mistake my hair for a weapon when it is indeed a target, the only piece of evidence in a murder case that will not go to trial, and yet here I am, standing at TSA, me and my black girl hair, convincing a U.S. government institution that I am not as violent as they are. The next time, the next time my hair is detained by TSA, they will treat my hair like a threat of violence. Not a victim, not a refugee, not an endangered thing, just looking for some place to go. This one time when I passed through TSA, I tied my shoes and waited. Young, confused, impatient, demanding my Americanized tongue less suspicious, my skin less suspicious, my documentation less suspicious than my mother. This one time when I passed through TSA, I tied my shoes and waited hearing abnormality emphasized for emphasis watching them grope like their commander-in-chief gropes, genitals, chests. My broad shoulders and beard less suspicious, my skin less suspicious, my identification less suspicious than my wife. This one time I passed through TSA, noting the ease with which I passed through TSA, again, unlike my immigrant family with suspicious body, documents, voice, detained again. I passed through TSA, unlike my trans wife with suspicious body, documents, voice, detained again, so that I might pass again. This one time I passed through TSA in a dissociative state, recalling, you're not complete. The DMV clerk declares gesturing at genitals is in the way of less suspicious documentation. You're not complete. The senior faculty member declares gesturing at genitals is in the way of job security. Choose masculine or feminine pronouns for your author biography, they write in their response to the piece on gender self-determination. Gesturing at structural limitations is in the way of another publication born of love and of free labor. Writing against obstacles that are in the way, clarity like yesterday, an intervention, have you had the surgery, they ask, while she screams in pain during the first hour of 14. He, they declare, during the second, third, and fourth hour of 14. Have you had the surgery, they demand, while she screams in pain during the fifth hour of 14. It's a he, they say, during the sixth, seventh, and eighth hour of 14. But have you had the surgery? They ask while she screams in pain during the ninth of 14 hours. We are looking for a facility for you, they assure during the 10th hour of 14. He, they assert during the 11th hour of 14. They only take real women, sir, they say during the 12th hour of 14. Please use feminine pronouns when talking about my partner.
I ask during the 13th hour of 14. You are banned from these premises, they say, looking down at my bloodied body laying on the ground. This one time I fell to pass as her spouse. Sir, are you okay? The TSA agent inquires as they grope like their commander-in-chief gropes. No, I respond. I am not okay, but what is our relevance when this is your legacy? Thank you. All right, how was that? Was that okay? Give it up one more time for Amani Cezanne and Benny Lamaster, <laughs> who both did wonderful work. And to quote Benny Lamaster, both did uh, beautiful work that used uh, emphasis, uh, who emphasized for emphasis. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that. Um, as we continue right along, Put your hands together for our next artist and following performance respondents. Give it up for Rachel Nicole Hastings. And Dana Cloud. And Tris Suchi. Good evening, how are y'all doing? The poem I'm gonna share with you tonight is a part of a larger piece called The Minstrel Cycles. Not about what you think, so. This poem is entitled, Black Human. I am a black hue, men. 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 I am an African. But they call me nigger. I hail from the West Indies, but I'm still called a nigger. I am an Afro-Mexicana, labeled as nigger from Mexico. I said, no, please call me African-American. They said, same niggers, different nation. I said, no, 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 I am negrito. They said, baby niggers from the Pacific Islands. I said, once I was called more. They said Moors was like these OG niggas who traveled throughout the Middle East and Eastern Europe like 500 some odd years ago. We are humans and we have always been black. So when we talk about black culture in the United States, we have to be mindful not to start with slavery as the conceptual moment of our existence. If we are going to make the argument that blacks or Africans in America had complete social, cultural, and political systems that resulted in several thriving societies, cultures, and civilizations that predated our encounters with Europeans, then we have to take it back, y'all. Way, way back. Before the transatlantic slave trade, across the Middle Passage, over the city of bones, where we and all of our black African islands skinned were something more than any one nation, where we were the eye of God. We have to understand that the ancestors and the ancestors selected each of us of all the possible combinations of spirits to conjure up. They selected us. We have to take it back to then to before our feet left the continent of Africa. If we are going to make that argument, which I am, then we have to remember that of all the possible combinations of spirits to conjure up, the ancestors and the ancestors are still with us and they selected each and every one of us to enter this world today to bring a change to a land that denies our human potential before we are even born. We are black humans. They call us African American, but we are black men and black women with roots in the island where we were once called Negro, with roots in Mexico where we were once called Negro, with roots in the United States where we were once called Negro. We are black seeds who will one day grow into black humans. 
I speak to you today as a professor of black men, but I am also the partner to a black man, the daughter to a black man, the sister to a black man. I am the mother of two beautiful baby black boys who will one day grow into black men. I am the black man's woman. Okay, no, fuck that. I'm my own damn woman. But the black man, he understands that. He gets that. He honors that. He understands that I am his other, his mother, his sister, his daughter, his lover, his teacher, and his student. I've been raising black men my whole life because they keep raising me up. And it is up to us not to give up. Let us remember today that each of us has a personal responsibility to the preservation of our culture, an imperative, a purpose. Each and every one of us will play a role in the theater of race relations. And it is up to you to decide how you will perform Remember that you were destined for another outcome, but that you showed up here instead. Remember that you are not alone, that you may be the only one who looks like you, who talks like you, who acts like you, who sounds like you, though you may be the only one who shares your specific identity, you are not alone. You ain't the only one who's been impacted by the conditions of our culture. Your father isn't the only one. Your brother isn't the only one. Your son isn't the only one. Your husband isn't the only one. You are the norm. One in three African-American men will go to prison at some point during their lifetime, which means that the women who love them will be impacted, which means that the families who love them will be impacted, which means that each and every one of us in this room will be impacted by the epidemic of these missing black men. Let us remember that so that the cycle may be dismantled and we may begin to ask the question, what role will we play in our solution? Rachel's powerful poem invokes the black cultural memory of a time before, before modernity, when black humans were not confined to any particular place or continent, before encounters with the Europeans who would ultimately brutalize, steal, and enslave them. It is an optimistic vision that calls on the listener to step up, and the poet and the listener are black humans, and the project is the claiming of a black identity beyond slash before colonialism and slavery. Reclaiming the category of the more slash more uh, speaks to how a people who were later enslaved are more than the history of slavery. The Moors were not a distinct or self-defined people having traveled and occupied parts of Europe and North Africa during the Middle Ages. The ambiguity of the figure of the Moor leaves it open for the taking. The invocation raises two opportunities for me for inquiry. The first is a question about the well-established historical case that blackness as we understand it today as an identity category did not exist before modernity, before um, the need uh, of a system to brutalize, steal, and enslave. And capitalism was built on slavery justified by the creation of the idea of race. So I ask what resource um, is the figure of the Moor, what does it offer for resistance against racism? Is it an invocation of a time before as a place of radical self-definition? I know the answer to that question, okay. Um, all right, <laughs> to, to, envision, to envision a pre-racial moment or a pre-racist moment for subjectivity is to envision a time when our divisions did not fall along lines of skin color. Any struggle for justice in that context or any living in peace would involve the solidarity of others whose heritage may or may not be that of Moors, but of those traveling with and around those with darker skin without assigning any particular meaning to distinctions of shade. How is the deep memory connected with the imagination of a future? Is the reclamation of that memory construct useful 
in envisioning solidaristic cross-racial movement today. What do black freedom fighters do with a call to remember the absence of race itself while fighting against those categories that are influential in the here and now? Is multiracial solidarity possible or desirable? These are questions raised not only in this poem but in the Black Lives Matter movement. What identities and memories can we claim and do we claim essentially and strategically to get resistance done? What is the relationship between the claiming of a self who is more and movements that confront the ongoing racism that is of more recent origin and its enactment in police violence and mass incarceration? How can we perform this work together? <laughs> broke my foot two days ago. I'm so thank you. <laughs> I'm just explaining why I'm so not coordinated with all this stuff, the hardware and the stuff. And I rehearsed this standing up, so stand I will. <laughs> I love that we are opening this NCA convention with performing poetry. I came to this profession when we called that oral interpretation. And NCA was SCA, and it seemed full of people performing poetry. Or maybe it was just beginning to shoo them away for at least the second time in its history. Why is it that, we, that when we get nervous about rigor, the very first people we kick down or out are the poets. <laughs> Oral interpretation is an old term that we retired, but the beating heart of what it valued is still here, but transformed, made new, sound, and tight. And I will get back to those three words. So poets opening this conference, thank you. And Dr. Johnson, and Dr. Johnson, Thank you. In 2015, in the Paris Review, polyglot translator Damon Searles queries the meaning of the word poet. Tracing its etymology produces frustration, conundrums, dead ends. So studying the words neighbors, Searles writes of the German. And then, then there's dichte, usually translated poet but meaning a creator of poetry in the grand sense. The verb dichten means to write poetically and well, the good stuff. The writer as hero of the spirit. How do you say that in English in one word? We don't have a word for hero of the spirit. I'll come back to that too. I'm suddenly a senior scholar. My body is marked as, well, old, white, female, not the most endangered species. Though I've had some skirmishes, I'm sure you all have my share of mansplains, some hashtag me's too. <laughs> I've spilt far too much sweat and ink explaining to those who sit in judgment for instance, what performance has to do with performance studies, or what bodies have to do with knowledge, or what doing has to do with learning. And lately, more mundane things lap away at my legacy. Cultures of suspicion and their accoutrement, their endless parade of ass assessment matrices, workday accounting software, don't go there. <laughs> endless reviewing of everyone and everything. These are to me old dance steps by now, and frankly, I am far more interested in my legacy in doing things that I know are valuable than explaining that value to folks who think we just look like we are having too fine a time to be useful. 
then this year, another chronic illness moved into this body. And I'm being literal, but I'm also being a giant metaphor. It's mostly invisible, so I keep it to myself, not quite marked. Meanwhile, my nation went insane-er. And I woke up ashamed, angry, aghast, called to new dances of resistance. What is it like to use the body to push back? Well, Dr. Hastings has just told you how it is to hit back with history. And as the statues begin to wobble and you hear the cries, oh no, but history, our legacy, holler back deeper histories. <laughs> Cry foul, insist exactly what kind of legacy. Who put that statue up and when and why? Insist that history isn't a matter of pedestaled men of stone and steel who are a form of saying, these bodies up here on these horses, not yours, are marked as valued. Push back, push hard, push them the hell over. Insist the way, insist the way that Michael Harper does entwined in Dr. Hastings' first stanza, say it over and over and over until the new, the only statues we have are made of voices singing who we really are. Sound and new and tight. Dr. Hastings sings this and her call demands a response. She is dicta, per performer as hero of the spirit. In my privilege, I have never had to push that hard, not like that, but rather more like this, from a poem by Michael Blumenthal, which is called A Marriage, but allow me to butcher it, to uh, just radically recontextualize it and call his poem instead a university. <laughs> you are holding up a ceiling with both arms. It is very heavy, but you must hold it up or else it will fall down on you. Your arms are tired, terribly tired, and as the day goes on, it feels as if either your arms or the ceiling will soon collapse, but then unexpectedly something wonderful happens. Someone, a student, a colleague, walks into the room and holds up their arms to the ceiling beside you. So, you finally get to take down your arms. You feel the relief of respite, the blood flowing back to your fingers and arms, and when your colleague's arms tire, you hold up your own to relieve her again, and it can go on like this for many years without the house falling. What is the damn house in this poem? If we spend all our energy holding it up, what is our legacy, our relevance? What if it was to renovate that house? So back to Damien Searles and Dichte. In, in German, Dicht also means tight, as in watertight or airtight. And the verb Dichten is also to seal, to caulk, to make impermeable as well as to make more dense or compact. The poet Ezra Pound played on this pun in his second most well-known slogan for what poetry does, the first being make it new. To write poetry, he said, is to condense and supercharge language. Searles concludes, don't just make it new, make it tight. And taking a cue from Pound, Searles, from Dr. Hastings, and the dicta of this opening session, our legacy, our relevance, is to make this house sound, of sound, new, and tight. That's our legacy. That's our relevance. Thank you. One more time, one more time for Rachel Hastings.
for Dana Cloud and for Trish Suchi. I don't think you all know how much this opening session gives me joy. So many of the people here I have known since I was undergrad and grad, uh, a grad student, uh, such as Rachel uh, Hastings, who uh, is my sister whom I love all, with all of me. Uh, also my other sister, Imani Cezanne, who I coached as a poet before, um, who in many ways taught me so much. Um, and, and, and then Ed Mabry, who we'll hear from in a second, who is like one of the best to do it. He's phenomenal. Um, and then um, Jeffrey, who we'll hear from later, who's like my big brother. He's my older brother in academe. Um, uh, he don't want to say it, but he's, you know, it's cool. Um, but, but, but this panel, and then Amber Johnson, who, who was here with me uh, on this and, and co-chairing this, has been just such a delight. Um, so thank you all for being a part of this. Are you all ready for the third group of performers? Put your hands together for Ed Mabry. For Miranda Oltzman. And for Julianne Scott. Good evening, NCA. We want to thank you for coming out tonight for this staged reading. You all look so beautiful tonight. Now, we think we have a winner on our hands with this one. Now, for those that are new to this, a libretto is the reading of the text of an opera, including all stage direction. So without any further ado, we present to you the libretto of the opera, Death of a Black Boy. Curtains open. Sun rises on anywhere, USA. Small kitchen with mother at stove, we never see her face. The black boy sits at table eating soft piano. The mother sings a song, how lucky might I have a boy such as this. Violins giggle, cellos chuckle. The black boy sings a song, I'm gonna get us out of here one day, into father. Director's note, the part of father has been canceled. Replace father with empty notes from woodwind section. Woodwind section plays the song Absence. Act one, into mother's boyfriend. Director's note, the role of boyfriend shall be titled temporary, regardless of instrument backing. Boyfriend sings the song, trick where's my breakfast? Why you feeding him first and I'm the one helping you with these bills. Director's note, option to replace this song with give me your car keys. Boy leaves, piano one and two begin walking music, concrete be played by strings, percussion perform song broken glass everywhere. Act two, the black boy tries to make it a school alive. The black boy walks through his neighborhood. Cue homeless men, cue daytime hookers, cue drug dealers. Drug dealers sing song, I got a job for you. Blaring car horns by trumpets, section one, all instruments, stop. Cue single snare drum. The black boy enters school. Lockers sing insecurity. Walls perform inferiority complex. Teachers sing overwork and underpaid. The career counselor sings you won't live to see 20, so why discuss job opportunities? The principal sings I touch a child in an inappropriate manner. The school board sings, keep the student to teacher ratio high enough to keep federal funding going, and if things get bad, just fire some teachers. The students sing, all in all, we're just another brick in the wall to you, aren't we? Act three, the black boy goes home. The next section will be simultaneous. Cue timpani to replace gunshots to his head by local police. Stage left, mother sings with my son to get home today. Stage right, father sings, I'll do better tomorrow. Upstage, boyfriend sings, when did I stop caring? Homeless man sings, I used to live around here. Hooker sings, said I didn't want to see my babies. Drug dealer sing, if you don't care, why should we? Apartment building sing, don't it make my brown eyes blue. Cue police officer, cue neighborhood watch vigilante, cue stand your ground. Black boy sing the song. Wallet on the ground, sun in the sky, bullet in my back. Cell phone in my hand, bullet in my face. Skittles in my hand, iced tea in my blood. Switch the sweet in my hand, college bound in the wind. And 100 police officers singing bad moves rising. And the Fox News singing, pleased to meet you, hope you guess my name. Cue a thousand bullets singing, dead men can't be witnesses. Keep snare at bass drum, upright bass with bow. Off cue piano, cymbals crash, and stop! Violins and cellos hum of a million bees whispering. Single street light center stage on the black boy. Sopranos sing and the blood came a trembling down. Cue Michelle and Barack, tennis sing too much, too little, too late. Light fades to black on black boy as moon sings, change gone come. 
the end. Director's note, if we do this right, we can bring this opera back every week around the country and they won't even notice. Please tell the producers we have found a hit to cover the blood on our hands. As I listen to this poem I remember, I go back in time to my town. I was a white working class child in the rural north. I understood racism like I understood the opera. I'd heard about them. On a television special I turned off, maybe in a book I didn't finish. Racism and the opera were in other places, where other people, people unlike me, living lives unlike mine, experienced reality far away from where I was. They used words I didn't know and a plot I couldn't follow. I didn't ask questions. It didn't concern me. Racism and the opera, I'd heard about them. But in my small, all-white town, we didn't have a stage or people of color. Both were concepts I heard but didn't understand. I should have noticed. I could have. But I didn't. As I listen to this poem, I remember. I go back in time to my town. To a few weeks ago, to when my six-year-old got off the bus. He looked at me and back to the bus, concerned, noticing. In our racially divided southern city, we send our son to the side of town people warned us about. Be careful of that area. Those brown bodies sitting on their small porches are dangerous. We were more nervous about the all-white school on the right side of town. Where we heard whole classes of all-white students voted for hate, celebrated its victory, White privilege oozing all over our son's education seemed dangerous. And that school on the wrong side of town has a Spanish immersion program. Bodies of all different colors and places in life attracting students from mansions and the projects. So we entered the lottery for that experience of bilingualism, of diversity. We won, but our son looks concerned. What happened, honey? I ask. Mama? One of my friends says his dad has a big boat. He said his dad worked hard and made good choices. Well, buying a big boat is a choice some people have and some people don't, I say. I don't think all his daddy's choices are as good as he says, Mama. And riding a big boat doesn't seem all that hard. I nod as he questions the ethics that often lead to big boat ownership in our coastal town. <laughs> then he continues. I have another friend, Mama. His dad's in jail. He said he made bad choices. I respond slowly. Sometimes people go to jail for bad choices. It doesn't mean they're bad people. My son pauses. But some people think he's bad, Mama. The police do. My friend says he's scared of the police. That he, his mama, and his brothers, they're all scared. They said the police don't like them because they're black and they're scared of them. The police and their guns and their jails, no matter what choices they make, they're scared. They're scared because of racism, Mama. Racism is hurting my friend. And he said white people did it. We do racism. We've been doing it for a long, long time and we have to stop. Did you know about that? Staring into his green eyes, I answer, yes, yes, I know. What are we doing? What are you doing to stop it then? We have to fix it. I look at my son, reminded of the power of embodied performance. Body to body, we are less able to ignore the lived experience of another. We can't ignore the bodies in front of us. Their bodies matter. Their bodies matter to us. Racism, like the opera, are here 
we notice we're on stage in this overwhelming plot. We always have been. We're just not ignoring it now. We notice. We see our bodies, our white bodies. We did it. We have to fix it. I hear this poem, and I remember. I accept my role. Too high, a little too short. <laughs> Our legacy needs to be better. Notorious white responses after Ed Mabry's libretto. The curtains open. Cue Fox News tone. Act one, enter stage far right. Chorus of white women softly singing, we really need to get all of the information. Cut in voices of white mothers getting louder and louder. We really shouldn't worry about the death of a thug. We have to worry about those poor kids in Africa. Chorus of white women softly singing, he must have done something. An officer wouldn't kill someone because of nothing. Vibrato streams up from a large mass chorus belting out while he shouldn't have been selling Lucy's. And besides, if he wasn't so fat, he wouldn't have died. Soprano streams up from the large mass chorus stating, well, he shouldn't have resisted arrest. Altos blend in with them sharing, well, he was playing really loud music. The basses sing the tune while he was carrying Skittles and an Arizona iced tea. I think he was pretty tall. Soprano stream back with, I believe he might have stolen something. Not to be outdone. Cue choruses of white men loudly singing, stand your ground, repeat at least six times. Director's note, make sure to have the following moment drown out all voices coming from other spaces. Ends with a bang of percussion session and the voices of all repeating, hashtag all lives matter, hashtag blue lives matter. Exit stage far right to the sound of Fox News breaking news tone. Act two, cue MSNBC breaking news tone. Enter stage far left. Cue Facebook notification sounds. The clicking sounds of the keys begin to feel overwhelming. Enter the good white liberal and the better white liberal. <laughs> Cue shock that a black boy has been killed by the police. The good white liberal sings, oh my gosh, how did this happen? This doesn't seem real. The better white liberal sings, what is happening in this world? Cue them sharing the video feed of the black boy who was killed over and over, typing hashtag Black Lives Matter without knowing who began it. Share again. Guitars play the dings of an oven. Harp strum while they return to coffee and sheet cake and morning nonsense chatter. Cue Facebook notification noises. The video gets many likes. Piano one and two play the confusion sound of what a like means on this kind of video. Piano one and two play again. Turn the volume up on the video of the black boy who has been killed. Cue a large projection screen to show the live video feed of him being murdered on repeat. Cello one plays the Facebook sharing sound over and over and cello two has to take over so as not to overwhelm cello one with the ease of sharing something and moving away from it. Director's note, all actors in the scene should not be distinct from one another. Continue playing the live video feed of him being murdered. Show no regard for the folks who fear this happening to their bodies every day. Percussions play police sirens in the background. Actors continue as though nothing has happened with no concern. Exit stage far left to the sound of MSNBC breaking news tone. Act three, QCNN breaking news sound. Enter reporter. Reporter sings, we need body cams. Enter protesters belting out, people do not believe the footage from body cams. Reporter sings, and dash cams should be on at all times. Protesters continue to belt out. Officers have been propping up the hoods to block dash cams. Reporters saying video footage will ensure indictment. Protesters continue to belt out it never has before. Cue violins to play out the reporter's confusion over flaws in the legal system. Cellos change the station. ESPN sounds out. 
to a nameless and faceless reporter. His vibrato is powerful as he's saying Kaepernick needs to stop kneeling and just play football. Percussion sighs, guitar strings play the ESPN tone, the lights go down, curtains close. Director's note, end abruptly. Move on as though nothing has happened. Wait for the next time. Cue disbelief and feign shock ahead of time. Wow, give it up one more time for Ed, Miranda, and Julianne. I don't know about you, but I'm physically shaking. I am sweating. I don't think an opening session has ever opened my pores like this before. Um, but I think that this is what relevance looks like when it's embodied, right? This is what relevance feels like. And I'm also left wondering if a, a director and their squad was following me around, shouting out the stage directions of my life as a black, gender fluid, queer human, what would you hear? And would you be prepared for the invisible labor becoming visible? Um, probably not. Uh, all of us have our own invisible labor too. Um, our next awesome human coming to the stage is our final respondent um, in true academic style. We couldn't leave the opening session without an academic response, but I'm sure Jeffrey is going to um, change our ideas of what that means, right, and keep that relevance going as we feel this in our pores and our bodies. So welcome Jeffrey McCune for our final response. I'm full. I'm thinking of Chiron in Moonlight, who echoed the words that his tears overwhelmed him so much that he felt like he was drowning. That's the kind of the space that I've been in, in the last six months that most people don't know. And today I'm full. So I'll stop my response. It's like music playing. Do y'all hear the, the, the kind of the other soundtrack that's playing? It's actually quite appropriate, and you'll see in a minute. <laughs> All right. So today we have seen and heard beauty, politics, and poetics, born of embodied experience between and betwixt life and death caught in the field of discourse that is our present. Here we heard folks doing what Javon Johnson has theorized as killing poetry. A use of poetry which always understands death is the beginning of another possibility and something beyond rather than an end. So this is the beginning. An invocation for the conversation NCA and other fields have yet to have. And for me, it is the emission of the Minosian queer, the not yet here, but foreseeably on the horizon. These poems for me were just pivot points, jump offs, clarifications, and gestures towards something beyond. But as a good performer scholar does, I will take my cue from Ed Mabry as his poem took up a question that I believe all the poems wrestled with. What do we do when the canon is no longer enough? How do we continue to play classical music when the utility of the instrument has expired? or when the instrument continues a cycle of violences which make music for some and noise for others, but produce a symphony of sickness nonetheless. What does it mean to funk it up? Rather than do what is classic, classical, or of the lineage. What does it mean not to ask the same questions? After all, didn't we make these arguments already? For what we have yet to reckon with, 
or better put, what wrecks us all up is that we have 103 rituals of violence, which we still do not know how to eradicate. We have 103 remnants of community for which we have yet to realize its radical relevance. If it were solved, we would not still be explaining the, the need for thuggified diversity in a sea of passive whiteness. If this were solved, we would not find ourselves after year after year meeting in problematic scenes where nobody said a thing to find our discursive underwear in a bunch as we land in a space which has always already been a representation of theft, brutality, anti-immigrant, anti-black, anti-queer, misogyny, and prototypical responses and processes of reproduction. If we had realized radical relevance, which would be essentially anti-legacy, we would not be offended by suggestions that we have not shown evidence of moving beyond, but instead we would be examining the interior of the intercultural collaborations that are not happening at the scene of communication. If we are listening, or if we were listening, we would know the difference between the minority and the majority. The difference is that one carefully remembers and the other carefully forgets. Choosing the right methodology is an important task to fixing legacy issues. And working on this may be the first step for moving from poetry to poesis. But if my memory serves me correct, we have been here before. On the ships, after the ships, from Martin to Malcolm, to Barack and Michelle. And here we are again. And the relevant question for us at the margins, marginalized, made monstrous, is where do we take flight? To take flight means to forget the weight of white supremacy and its attendants, but to seek freedom beyond the poetic proselytizing of human liberal subject. I ask, what of a world where we do not revere the human, the normative embodiment of the protocol or prosthetics we have come to require for kinship and community? What does a monstrous legacy look like? Where we remove citizen, human, subject imperatives and opt for non-citizen, thug, monster, object imperatives. After all, this is what we are. There will never come a time when black and brown and queer bodies are normalized. Yet, we can hope for a time when the white whip does not cut the hair, kill the body, capture the free, and create the dead. There will never be a time where the most relevant body will not be cis and gendered normatively. But we hope for a time where the commitments to practice proper pitches of gender is continuously challenged as not an abnormal processes but the actual processing of making and doing gender. Why should we still have to whistle Vivaldi? Why? When nigger anthems have been holding us up. When gospel riffs have kept us elevated. Yes, that's the preacher in me. When Sun Ra has given us the sun that doesn't beat our backs, but makes us brave. Why should we pursue the human when the human seems so sick? Why can't we see the disease in their eyes? Why can't we see the dis-ease in their own eyes? My grandmama said, my grandpa said, 
those who carved this legacy as great and worthy of celebration, stop. Come back from your temporal bliss to have radical relevance. This means no pat on the back by those who look, think, and feel like you. This means a place where whiteness makes you nauseous. It means a deep encounter with the arguments, an intercultural tension, a contaminating encounter, a ghettoized discipline, a thuggified diversity integrated in every unit of this institution, a stench of blackness and brownness that does not smell like chipotle or sweetie pie's fried chicken. A radical relevance may mean a new rhetoric, new questions, and a new terrain on which you stand quiet and not always talking. It may mean new dispensation and dispositions, being not the expert, but the learner listener. It may mean moving from the office to spaces of obstruction and objection. It means new legacy where dialectical tension is not a bad word, where monstrous intimacy is just an engagement with an other that forces you to know yourself and all of your ugly, where certain questions are no longer relevant or necessary. It is a rigorous time. Huh. It is a time be beyond what we have come to know it is a time we have never had. And yet seemingly, somewhere, which can start today. Thank you. invite all of our performers up so we can give everyone another round of applause and we're also going to do a Q&A. Um, How do you feel about that opening session? Do you feel open? So I'm going to take one of these mics. I'm going to put it down there. Um, so if you have questions, just come up to the mic and ask away. Don't everyone come to the mic at once. Please, <laughs> slow down. I'm sure I don't mind asking the first question. Um, you know, one of the things that happens in a session like this is that we hear a particular set of experiences um, and, and a particular set of standpoints and people try to find themselves in the discourse. And they try to make sense of whether or not those standpoints actually um, compel their own everyday behavior and everyday realities. And so um, I remember years ago saying to a student that how do we devise a cure when the whole society is sick? I'd like to pose that question to the panel. If a whole society is sick, how do you devise a cure? How do you actually help individuals to move beyond where they are now when they don't even think of themselves as having a problem in the first place? Well, I'm a speechy, so um, I think, at least for me, um, there's one thing that each and every one of us has in this room and everybody you know, has access to, and that's our particular voice. 
right? And so when we learn to cultivate our voice and we learn to uh, shape our expression and we learn to either put it in words or put it in images or put it in some type of aesthetic that others can actually witness, then we participate in dialogue. So I don't know if there's a particular cure that all of us can like access. I don't know if there's like a vaccine that we can get a shot of, but I do know that each of us has a voice. And as a speech teacher, I invite like my students to come in and I say, come as you are. I'm not trying to erase any of your background. I'm not trying to tell you you have to speak proper English. I'm not trying to tell you that you, know, you have to become someone else. I'm trying to ask you to tap into who you are, what you believe in, what you value, and then to take ownership over that. Once you can do that, then I think we can have good dialogue with one another. So. Oh, there's another question? Oh, okay. Uh, thank you all for uh, your words, your thoughts, your voices, and uh, the synthesis of emotion and situation that you brought to the stage today. Uh, one thing uh, that I often find is I, uh, I recently posted online with all the conversations around these issues that are happening that I'm withdrawing from social media conversation because I have the opportunity to talk 80 minutes a day, twice a week, 15 weeks in a row to 20 year olds about these issues, and I feel a unique um, value and power in driving those conversations. And I do not want to spend my time fighting in meme form online. So my question is to you, anyone, all of you, how do you social media? And I'm using social media as a verb, so you know, how do you social media? How do you bring these things into a new platform um, that is inherently fast paced, often in my, can be, but often tends to be a bit more uh, short in the conversational format. So how do you social media? How do you have these conversations in the digital space? Um, well, one, I'm just playing inappropriate um, on social media. <laughs> um, I think that it, it's funny that you'd speak on social media specifically after I did this poem. Um, I wrote this poem a couple weeks before I was actually kicked off of an American Airlines flight for doing nothing more than being black um, and not silent. Um, and so I went to social media because I couldn't find a customer service number for American Airlines, first of all. Um, and secondly, beca <laughs> secondly, because I know the power and the, the immediacy of social media. And I think that's what, what, I guess, the tool or the resource that I use social media for. It's that, that instant gratification, um, whether I'm going off on you, whether I'm you know, claiming American Airlines as racist because they kicked me off the flight, whether I need to share or, or vent my own personal issues just because that's the platform that I choose to do so. Um, the fact that it is immediate and it is, um, it is instant and it does allow for me to be who I am in real time um, and speak to and respond to in real time so that it's not this kind of delay. And I think in the delay is where often that miscommunication lies. Um, and so, you know, you come at me now, I'm gonna come back now. You know, and so now we can talk about it now, and it's not, oh, well, yesterday, or that was a long time ago, now what happened now? And when you talk about it now, and when you figure out the solution now, um, and so I think that's how I use social media. I uh, post a lot of the conversations between my three sons online, mm. and um, they're very sweet in some ways, uh, they're in, or enraging, depending on who you are and how you feel about the world. <laughs> and uh, so I found that that's been a, a good way to say, this is how my family, how these little people who haven't been in the world long see things very clearly and are asking really important questions. And, and I found it has been a, a way for me to process how to parent 
how to parent in the times that we're in, as well as ha give other people both hope and questions and have those confrontations in a space uh, that perhaps in person uh, wouldn't be as effective because there wouldn't be so many voices coming into it together. Uh, so that, so in that way, I've uh, I found that social media has been really productive to be able to have these complex uh, conversations and starting that with the words of adorable little boys has helped, uh, I think, more voices come into that conversation with me. I, I'd like to um, answer this in a slightly different way. Apparently, I use social media to call for violence against the radical right and white supremacy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so, uh, but this, this speaks to another thing, which is that, I mean, almost exclusively I use social media to build social movements, um, which um, is, but it, this is not to deny the, the poetic and the um, existential um, uses. Um, I, I just have a very instrumental mentality about is this going to build the movement? How many people can I get out? <laughs> you know, how, how many people um, are seeing this who will be motivated to um, engage in struggle in public? Um, and for me, that's the most, th that's the utility of social media, and that's uh, also an answer to the question about what, what can we do now, and I really think it, the moment is, cr it's crucially important in our historical moment to be public and visible with our, our voices and to actually t be uncivil. I mean, so this is, uh, <laughs> NCA um, has a, it's like there's a cult of um, tolerance and civility. There's a, a sort of a fetish, um, <laughs> And you know, even when things are intolerable, and there is no reason to be civil because um, because s things have to be shut down. Um, you know, like white supremacists have to be shut down, and also we have to challenge all the institutions and the everyday um, everyday brutalities. Um, but when the pinnacle of that expression comes out and tries to take space. Um, and to take our campuses. Um, I think that civility and tolerance are absolutely the wrong uh, modalities of, of response. Um, hence, uh, turning back to the social media question, which is about, um, the, we also have to ask how are they using <laughs> social media and how can we protect ourselves from um, the way that they use it as weapons. Uh, I just, uh, there's sort of two ways uh, that I use social media. First is uh, sort of the front stage, which is the actual streams themselves. And uh, I'm a first generation college student, what, what? Um, and as a result, that also means that a lot of my uh, engagement or the discourse I uh, engage online is a, a lot about teaching, teaching people I grew up with who did not have access to what I now have access to. Uh, that's one component. Uh, the second component is backstage. It's a lot of the private messages and a lot of mentoring that happens in private. And I know that a number of us, I'm sure, do the same labor that's part of that sort of just unseen labor itself. And that is uh, arguably the biggest component of my social media use. It's behind the scenes, really. I think, and, and if I could add really quickly, I think the other piece of it, uh, because I echo Benny, Dana, uh, Amani, and Rachel, I also use it in addition to that uh, uh, for joy, right? Uh, for silly purposes, because ain't black joy radical and generative and necessary? Ain't queer joy radical, generative and necessary? Ain't black girl magic radical, generative and necessary? And I think the, 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 the kind of community to find joy, even in these horrific moments, horrific spaces, is utterly necessary and utterly radical and utterly uh, uh, a move towards something better, even if it's only a uh, uh, sort of uh, temporal. Hi there. Um, first of all, as a poet, I want to say thank you for the inspiration and the tears. You guys uh, kind of kind of shook me up a little bit. Um, but I, uh, my question is, a lot of times we like, and I go to U University of North Texas at Dallas, I'm UNCD, um, and my, yeah, woo! And uh, my question is, a lot of times we diverge art and academia, in, in a th and I think it's relevant in our school as well, but how do we combine those, and how do you as artists and as academics combine those two together? 
that's a uh, great question. Um, and there's, people don't know this, but there's a lot of institutions that have performance studies programs embedded into their institution um, that, that do that important work. Uh, many of us are graduates of those programs here. Uh, but, but, but I would like to, to pose an actual method, right? Because um, one of the things that I do on social media is I actually, I will post poems, right? to respond to a moment. Um, but even in our work, right, where we think sometimes we're doing these qualitative interview studies, right, um, and, we, and we think that, the, that that means that we ultimately, ultimately must um, reframe the narratives or, or only use, you know, epilogues that are coming from the people who we talk to. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, you know, I draw from like Nikki Giovanni and I'm like, that fits exactly what I'm trying to argue right here, right? And, and put that into the actual um, document or, or, or essay. Um, but I also think that finding places, uh, we can't expect the academy, and so this is the very important point. I did not say this in my response. We also can't expect the academy to do everything for us. The institution wasn't built for us, most of us, right? <laughs> and, 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 and it wasn't built for those of us who actually take performance as uh, the mode through which we best communicate, right? right? And so I don't expect it to always accommodate my my love for performance, right? That I have to go outside and perform elsewhere, whether that be a pulpit, whether that be uh, a, a poetry club, whether that be Facebook, but I'm gonna find my space. And so for me, I always push back against, it has to be inside of the work, but it can be, but it also can be inside of your everyday life. So, a couple of things. You see this stage up here, right? The first step to combining those things is to not think of them as opposition. There is a, a woman holding a baby at the opening session of NCA on the stage, right? And nobody said, Rachel, listen, I know you brought a baby. And I know that that's not all normal, but, but I'm willing to maybe let you have the baby on stage just at the very end. Like, nobody said that. Rachel said, I'm gonna take my baby on stage. That's my point. Rachel said, I'm gonna take my baby on stage, and nobody's going to tell me yes or no, right? And that, to me, is what it looks like when we take what's inside of us and forge a path from that versus reflecting what the institution tells us we can forge. Um, so I'm, I'm a polymath, so I'm a painter, a photographer, a poet. They're all Ps except one, a percussionist, a professor, which isn't art unless you're me. I, I'm an artist in the classroom. Y'all are artists too. Anyway, y'all are artists too. That, that wasn't very nice. Um, and then, and I'm a, I, I'm a. Somebody told me I should call it a, um, a precious metal tinkerer. I don't know. I make jewelry. There's no people that. Um, and I noticed that when I was in college, and as a junior faculty person, that no one taught me how to include all of those things into my work. No one, they told me teaching, research, service, you do those three, three things, you master those three things, and that is your life. And if you do those things a little bit mediocre, you might get full professor one day. Um, and so for me, when I, when I go out and I give talks at universities and stuff, I talk about this thing called radical inclusion, which starts with the personal. And it starts with me saying, I'm going to include my whole self in spaces, and I'm gonna stop compartmentalizing the pieces of me um, that matter because that makes my work matter more. Um, so last year I decided I'm gonna build a mobile social justice museum. And I did, and I get questions almost every day. Is that research? Hell yeah, it's research. <laughs> is, that, is that teaching? Hell yeah, it's teaching. Is that service? Hell yeah, it's service, right? And, and it's all of those things, all at the same time. And when I was putting my tenure file together, I kept going back and forth with my chair saying, where does this go? And finally she's like, Amber, put it everywhere. And, that's, and that's, who I, that's how I move through this world, right? So for me, it's not about combining art and academics because academic work is art, and art is academic. It's about recognizing those things and stop compartmentalizing them. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Hi, I, uh, I have a newly minted PhD and <laughs> And I also, last year, published 
uh, a piece that incorporated poetry. And so I was surprised to hear about this history that you alluded to. And so I wanted to hear more about it. Like when, when did the poets you know, get kicked out? When did, what, what happened? What really went down? And, and also like as a discussion question, like a think question, like how did you interpret these, these things happening? And so, and I love history, so don't, don't okay. hold back. Like, let me know what happened. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I hate to do this, but I'm gonna send you s to some books. Um, one written by my mentor, the sublime Paul Edwards from Northwestern, um, called Unstoried, um, which was about the second banishment of the poets, but he reached back into the first one, and that's what, how I heard about it. And then when NCA had its millennial fever, when it had its 100th um, back in Chicago a few years ago, how many years ago? Three? Um, uh, there, were, there were some things published. There was, a, I think, a, a volume published that talks about, um, at one point, no, there's probably people in this room who are gonna go, no, no, you're wrong. But at one point, NCA, was called something else, what was it? Before, Before that, though. The Speech Association, see, I know there's people who know this. Anyway, it included what Paul in his volume characterizes as this whole sort of carnival of what I think were just like wonderful people like, you know, Mrs. Stebbins doing the, the Del Sart maidens and, um, you know, there were professional bird callers and just all kinds of extraordinary people. And what held them in common was that they, they took the platform and performed a lot. But you know, you can't have this. When people are trying to be serious academics, they don't want bird callers up on the platform with them. So they threw them out. Or there was a, a like they staged a jailbreak. And then I think the thing that became sexy, that became NCA, was, was the people who broke out. Although I may have messed up the story badly, but I do know there have been periodic, I don't want to use the word purge, but periodic sort of like, oh no, let's, you're not allowed to do poetry, you just, you, you, you may maybe talk about others who do it, but don't try to do it yourself. But that's nonsense, as Dr. Johnson is telling you here. We can't live our lives in little compartmentalized drawers. Um, and if there's one thing that has changed in me in these many, many years. And good luck to you, I hope you have the best career, really. Um, is that I, I am no longer willing to do that so much. And I'm surprised that I was doing it without thinking about it. And wonderful people have brought it to my consciousness that I don't need to do that, including this woman right here. All right. I hope that helps. First things first, if you ever get stopped by TSA again, you let me know. If my dad works for American, we'll get you a customer service agent. <laughs> <laughs> we'll tackle them together. You know, I had, a similar, I had a similar situation in one of the panels I was in earlier today talking about uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and it talked about injustice in, in uh, black people's lives and a lot of it ties into a lot of, uh, a lot of people's lives. And the one thing I find myself seeing every day in society is people who I myself see myself uh, as an advocate of change. I want things to change. I want everybody to have the same opportunities. But what I see from my personal perspective is I see people who are in, um, in a stage of content where they say, if it doesn't affect my life, then it shouldn't matter to me. But in actuality, in the smallest portion that it has, it does affect their lives. It's a, all a trickle-down method to where even the smallest, ad, even the smallest portion of their lives are being attacked. My question is, how do we get these people who are content, who think that the, who think that their lives are unaffected, to change that perspective and realize that if they have a voice, they should say it. And how do we as advocates bring that out of them? Yeah. 
Hey, um, thank you for that first. I'm gonna answer yours and I'm gonna be stupid enough to answer every other question with the exception of the history one. Um, <laughs> love, and this isn't the poet hippie moment, uh, to be clear on that. <laughs> to have the audacity to love into their spaces is how you affect their space. That does not mean hug someone while they stab you. <laughs> uh, what it does mean is love means to love from oneself. So if we love ourselves, then we will also have the audacity to be our authentic selves, uncensored all the time in all spaces, including the spaces that make us feel uncomfortable. So when you're around people who feel content in their ignorance and or their bigotry or their hatred, then you introduce your love into that space and that's a natural conflict and the love will eventually win. Keyword being eventually, uh, we people of color have had to learn how to use that. We have eventually stapled to our tongue on a regular basis. But by the more of us doing it, the better off we become. You understand what I'm saying? So by going to those spaces in terms of communication, since this is the NCA, communicating from a space of love, from I hear you and where you are, and here's me, and I'm not going anywhere. And in fact, I'm gonna to continue to take a step towards you. Uh, picture view if someone was content and or a bigoted mindset on this stage, and if everyone that's on this stage and in this room continued to take a step towards them, that's gonna be hella threatening for them, and we get that. But we're only coming in the name of love, in the name of our authentic selves. And the more we do so, the more we start to close in on them. And the more we do that, the more they realize, okay, this is in fact part of my community. This is in fact part of my environment. I have no choice but to address, accept it, and learn not how to tolerate it, but how I play a role in it. You understand? Mm -hmm. So then we can start to rewrite that code because in, in that terminology, hate exists because it devours anything that you love. Love exists because it'll love anything that you attempt to hate. So we keep pushing that narrative. So it's not that you walk around saying I love you all the time because that's tiresome. Uh, but the more we try to exercise that, because it's the harder work. It's the harder work to go into someone who's content space. It's the harder work to have these conversations. It's the harder work for Dr. Johnson to say something silly about his dog uh, knowing what's happening to, to people of color all over the world. And also then to turn and say that comment and then someone go, well, yesterday you seemed happy. You wasn't mad about black people yesterday. No, I had a happy moment. Forgive me for having that. You know, I had the audacity to be happy in a moment and try to bring joy into my life and join other people's lives. I apologize for that. You know, how crazy was I for doing so? So if all of us, uh, especially people, uh, the non-people of color, for lack of a better term, because if it's not both sides of that conversation, then you're just repeating the same mistakes over and over again. And you keep pushing that. Can I just add one, can I just add one thing here? Um, Y'all can clap because this keeps the tradition. Um, <laughs> I don't want to break up tradition, but what I'm about to say, Mike, um, I actually think, you know, and I'm not just being contrarian, I, I'll be fast, I'll try to be fast. Um, I actually don't think that we have to concern ourselves with this. I, I actually think that the, one of the problems of the legacy is it's always depending upon brown and black people to kind of to have to do the work of, of, of kind of, uh, of teaching doing the work of saving, right? And I just don't, I don't necessarily know that we can be preoccupied with that. I think that the legacy that we have to create is a, a legacy of white folks who are preoccupied with getting white folks together, <laughs> right? And, 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 I, and I say that with the deepest bit of love, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know? Because my love includes critique, right? And, and, and as long as we have love that does not include critique, it ain't love, right? And so we've been doing this thing, and, and Christians, particularly, and, and people who are religious folks, love to talk about love, right? But love always means not offering critique. And I think that the legacy that we've created is a legacy where critique, it, love is devoid of critique, and we have to begin if we're gonna love. So I'm, I'm with you, like, if I'm gonna do this work, I'm gonna do it with critique. Right, right. Um, but I, I really wanna push that we have to push back against brown and black folks doing all this labor. <laughs> you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> All right, so we have come to the end of our evening. I wanna give a huge round of applause to all of our awesome performers.
Give it up to Jeffrey, Ed, Imani, Rachel, Julianne, Dana, Trish, Miranda, and Benny, and myself and Javon are so thankful for all of you being here um, and all of the energy and love you gave to us.